original story written by Steve Gray and also narrated by the author. Brittany drove along the secluded, two-lane highway called Morris Bridge Road in Thanota, Sassa, Florida. It was getting late in the afternoon and she was anxious to get to a certain address to perform a gig she had scored for the weekend. A side hustle for her, while she studied nursing most every other portion of her existence. She figured that this was going to be a lot of fun. She got the job through a friend of a friend. She'd be in the country, away from annoying people, all by herself, and able to study as well as relax. As she drove, she continued to put miles behind her, and before too long, she was nearing the address. She cut intermittent glances at the screen on her phone and waited for the voice of the navigation app to inform her of where to turn. In 600 feet, your destination will be on the right, the map's voice asserted in its constant, matter-of-fact tone. Brittany turned onto the gravel driveway leading up to the ranch-style house where she would be house-sitting for the next few days. The couple she had been hired by were going on a weekend vacation and had trusted her with their home. Brittany had never been to this part of Pasco County before. She drove further onto the gravel driveway. She felt a sense of isolation, but also felt serenity by the change of scenery. She was used to the ongoing and, at times, disgusting rat race of Tampa. The house was set back from the road, flanked by a barn and surrounded by fields. She drove up the gravel way a bit more and parked. She exited her car and approached the front door. She then retrieved the key from atop of the front door frame where the couple had informed her that it would be located. She unlocked the door and with a pained creak, it opened, and she entered the house. The couple had left her a detailed list on the breakfast bar. It had a list of instructions and a phone number to call in case of an emergency. Of course, Brittany brought her laptop, books, and snacks to keep her occupied during her stay. After a while, and as she settled in, she noticed a sort of musty, eerie silence that hung over the entire inside. It was as if the world had stopped moving. As the night progressed, Brittany began to feel increasingly uneasy. The quiet was starting to become too oppressive, and she found it difficult to relax. She was already a nervous person by nature, so this was just par for the course. She decided to explore the house to take her mind off of things. The rooms were spacious and well furnished, and soon, she felt a sense of comfort in being surrounded by familiar objects. However, her peace would be short-lived. As she made her way back to the living room, she could swear that the air became heavy and foreboding. It made her heart feel like a cold lancet had pierced it swiftly, and she quickly took in a gasp. She worked to steady herself and then chuckled. Ridiculous. After all, she was in an unfamiliar place and wasn't accustomed to things as they were set in these surroundings. Also, the sun was starting to go down and the dimness of twilight was beginning to saturate the area. That could explain it away. As she sat down, she began to power up her laptop. She tried her best to settle in. She was attempting to connect to the internet, but was having an issue connecting. And after a few frustrating minutes and no dice, she sighed. She got up to make her way to the kitchen for a drink, and she noticed another hand-scrawled phone number on a piece of scrap paper held to the refrigerator by a magnet. The text above the number read, Sal's Pizza. Mmm, she muttered. That sounds good. She made up her mind that she was going to have pizza instead of the snacks that she had brought instead. So she located the landline phone in the living room and dialed the number. Just as the sun was setting that evening, a few miles away from where Brittany was house-sitting, a lone farmer, Brett was his name, had just finished his long day's work and was putting his antique tractor away in his barn. He heaved a heavy sigh of relief, happy to be done with the day. It was hot, humid, and miserable, and the bugs seemed to be even more persistent today. As he wrapped things up and secured the tractor, he heard a slightly violent rustling in the corner of the barn. He thought at first 
but it was just one of the farm animals. But as he turned around, he was met with a sight that would haunt him for the rest of his brief life. A large, imposing man, slicked with sweat, wearing what looked like a pig's mask, stood before him, brandishing a sharp machete. Brett's heart raced as he tried to make sense of what was happening. He backed away slowly, but this individual advanced on him with each step. Panic started to set in as Brett realized the man's insidious intent as he was in the barn with no escape. The large man in the pig's mask swung the machete with a sickening thud, and Brett fell to the ground, blood oozing from the gash. The sound of his screams echoed through the empty barn, but no one was around to hear them. The killer stood over Brett's lifeless body, admiring his handiwork. Slowly, he pulled out what looked to be a paring knife and set out to do an even more unspeakable act. He let out an eerie laugh that would have sent shivers down the spine of anyone who might have heard it. Soon, twilight deepened and was setting in even more so, casting a cloak of darkness over the scene. The murderer began to walk down the deserted road that communicated with the farmer's property, the only sound being the crunching of gravel under his boots. He had a sense of purpose, as if he were on a mission. The pig's mask hid his identity, but his eyes gleamed with an evilness that was unmistakable. As he walked along the deserted and quiet road, he soon came across a group of teenagers laughing and joking around. They paid him no mind, assuming he was just someone passing by, dressed for Halloween, a little prematurely they would think, but oh well, this is the sticks after all. Little did they know they were about to be his next victims. With a swift motion, the killer pulled out his machete once again and charged toward the unsuspecting teenagers. They scattered in different directions, screaming, but it was futile. The killer was too quick, too strong, and too evil. One by one, the teenagers fell to the ground, their screams ringing in the killer's ears like a symphony. Blood splattered his mask and clothes, and he seemed to bathe in it. He was on a mission, and nothing would stop him. The splashing of blood and the thuds of hacked and splintered bones were the sounds that filled the air, along with their screams. Shortly after this mayhem, the maniac continued to walk down the deserted road. No one could know where he came from or where he was going, but one thing was for sure. He was a force to be reckoned with. Detective Grames had been on the trail of the elusive and brutal mass murderer known as Oink for months. The killer had left a trail of blood and destruction wherever he went, and Grames was determined to stop him before he could claim any more victims. Sadly, his progress was moving too slowly. Oink was a cunning and elusive, albeit messy and gruesome killer who had managed to somehow evade capture for a long time. He had a particular modus operandi, targeting anyone and everyone at random and leaving behind a signature calling card. Horribly crude, pig-like figures chiseled from the bone particles of his victims. The killer had struck again and again, always leaving the police baffled and frustrated in his wake. Grames had been assigned to the case after the killer's latest victim was discovered. The young person had been brutally murdered, of course, and the only clue left behind was the small, bloody and grotesque bone pig. What made things confusing, however, was the fact that he never did this for all of his victims. Was this a method he used to throw the police off? To convince him that the killing and killers were different somehow? No one knew. The detective had spent countless hours poring over crime scene photos, interviewing witnesses, and analyzing the killer's vague patterns. He had become obsessed with catching Oink, and it had taken a toll on his personal life. His marriage had fallen apart, and he had become increasingly isolated as he dedicated all his time and resources to the case. Despite his best efforts, Oink continued to elude him. The killer seemed to always be one step ahead of the police somehow, leaving behind his horrid trademark. But Grames refused to quit. He knew that he was the only hope for the folks of Pasco County, and he was determined to bring Oink to justice. 
but if he were to do so, he would have to start moving faster. Having placed the call to Sal's Pizza some time ago, Brittany sat on the sofa. She was slowly starting to relax when her attention was suddenly drawn to something that looked as though it were standing in the yard outside of the dining room window. It was too dark to make out any features, but she could tell that it was a large man. Fear gripped her as she realized that she was now not alone. Having no knowledge of this place and being unfamiliar with the settings, she instantly recognized that whatever this person's intentions were, they definitely couldn't possibly be good. After a while of observing this person's malicious stalking, she tried to call the emergency number, but conveniently, her cell phone had no service. She rushed to the landline, only to find it was completely dead, and the line must have been cut. By him, she assumed. Brittany's heart was pounding in her chest now as she realized that she was alone. The man outside had not moved, and she could see that he was wearing something over his head. An animal mask of some sort. It was really too dark to tell. He carried a weapon that looked like it had a long blade, also from what she could tell. And she then knew he was there to kill her. Brittany tried to stay calm and think of a plan. She knew that what she had to do was make it to her car. Then she could speed out of there. She started haphazardly barricading the doors and windows, hoping to buy herself enough time to make a slip out the back door and then run as fast as she could to reach the car and make an escape from this obviously crazed individual. As she huddled in the corner, she could hear the man outside. He was now trying to break through her makeshift barricades. The night was going to draw out like a blade and would be terrifying as Brittany paced for her survival. Every sound made her heart race, and every creak of the floorboards made her jump. This maniac attempted to access the inside of the house. She knew that she had to keep moving to avoid being spotted, though. She tried to keep her wits about her, but the fear was overwhelming. Suddenly, for a small space of time, the chaos quietened. Her eyes flew open wide and rolled in every direction as she tried to comprehend what was happening. She sat quiet and waited. The pizza delivery guy that Brittany had called in 45 minutes prior had shown up on property as the pig man was in the thick of stalking her. The pizza boy, Mike, drove his car down the winding road leading to the ranch house. As he approached, he noticed that there were no lights on, which was odd. Man, I hope they ain't gonna try to stiff me, he muttered to himself as he looked for any sign of life. Mike parked his car and walked up to the front door, feeling uneasy about the situation. He knocked on the door, but there was no answer. He tried calling the number again, but it just rang relentlessly. Shortly, he was about to leave and he heard an odd clanging coming from the back of the house. Curiosity got the best of him and he decided to investigate. He made his way to the back of the house where he saw a figure standing in the shadows. As he approached, the figure stepped forward, revealing that face. Mike froze in terror as the maniac raised his machete and charged towards him. He tried to run but was caught off guard and fell to the ground. The maniac then proceeded to slash him up with the machete, leaving him bleeding and helpless on the grass. As he lay there, gasping for breath, he watched in horror as the maniac picked the pizza up and walked away. He knew that he was going to die, and all he could do was wait for the end. The maniac retreated back into darkness, leaving behind his bloody project. He had later returned to take the piece of bone necessary to carve his disgusting pig figurine. Now, he was stuffing slices of pizza by the handful through the open jaws of the pig's head and slurping the cheese and pepperoni in massive gulps. Mike's body lay on the ground, lifeless and mutilated. Brittany continued to squat in one of the cubby holes inside the dark house unaware of the carnage that had just taken place outside. A little more time went by, and it seemed as though she couldn't find an exit opportunity, and then soon found herself moving from one space of the house to another, as this maniac in a pig's mask began to once again batter and chop 
at every possible entrance of the house. He was determined by hell to reach her. Her shrieks started to become uncontrollable as the terror she was met with increased. The night was indeed drawing out like a blade and with no way to get help. Or was there? She glanced once more at her cell phone and noticed that she had one bar. She could call 911. That's what she did. But just as she did, the maniac in the pig's head crashed through one of the weakest barricades that she had put up, and as wood splintered in multiple directions, he was now inside and slowly looked at her and started to advance. She was going to be his next victim. Her screams were shrill and ear-piercing. She continued to attempt to evade him, but he just seemed to close in on her. They were in the kitchen, and as he backed her up against one of the counters, she reached behind her and grabbed an opened canister of salt, and as forcibly as she could, rifled it into the eyes of this maniac. He lurched back in utter agony as his burning eyes were filled with salt. She made a mad dash through the breach that he had created when he broke into the house and hustled to reach her car. Once she made it, and she was in the driver's seat, she looked in utter dismay at the empty ignition switch, just like Tippy Hedron in The Birds. She had left her keys inside, but there was no way she was going back in there, not when she knew she would have to face the enraged killer. So she sat slouched in the driver's seat with doors locked. After what felt like an eternity to her, she heard the sounds of sirens in the distance. The 911 call made it through. It was the cops. They were getting closer, and the hulking savage was emerging from the house. She tried to call out for help, but her voice was hoarse from screaming. Detective Grames, along with several officers, descended upon the scene, and after quite a bit of a violent struggle, apprehended the maniac and took him into forceful custody. Brittany was finally safe. She had survived the night. But the memory of this psycho and his horrifying mask would stay with her for the rest of her natural life. In the aftermath of the incident, Brittany learned that the killer had been roaming these particular parts for months, targeting unsuspecting random victims in the rural countryside. He had been dubbed Oink by the media and police, and she figured the obvious, that it was due to his distinctive mask but she learned later on that it was also because of his disturbing hobby of leaving the crudely carved bone pigs with various victims. Brittany was hailed as a hero, and her bravery was celebrated. She had faced her worst fears and emerged victorious. The couple who had hired her returned from their weekend trip, and having learned of what had happened, were grateful for her bravery, and over time they became close like a family. They offered her a permanent room if she'd be interested in staying and if she would be able to put the horror of what happened behind her. Brittany considered the dampened, dorm-like apartment she lived in currently and accepted their offer. Knowing that she had found a new home where she felt safe, she had faced the terror of Oink, and in doing so, she had found a new home in serene settings. <laughs>